When Kyle Dubas was hired, he was seen as a hockey prodigy, a man, or perhaps boy wonder, who's going to cause a paradoxical shift in the way managers construct teams. Due to his youthful perspective, aggression, and modern takes on advanced analytics, and well, Dubas would make a great first impression. Right out of the gate, he would be a part of the team that drafted Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews, he would sign John Tavares, uniting him back with his hometown. Amazing! However, it just kept happening. First round loss after first round loss. It didn't make any sense. With Austin Matthews and Tavares cementing their center core on top of many veteran additions, you would think, with their existing roster, it would be enough for a deep playoff run. However, we would witness the fallacy. What happens when you have too much of a good thing? In September of 2018, the San Jose Sharks would make a blockbuster deal as they would acquire the two-time Norris winner, Eric Carlson. And aside from the fallout of this trade, ouch, the Sharks now had two of the best defensemen in the game. Hell, Brent Burns and Carlson. And, and get this, we're top three in Norris voting seven times in the previous six years. In three of those years, they would win. Three trophies in six years is crazy. This might be the best decor we have seen in the cap era. Except they were the same player. Yes, Carlson has more of a finesse, silky playstyle, and Brent Burns utilizes his six foot five frame to allow for a power game, but. They are both right-handed shot offensive defensemen. In today's game, a defenseman who plays the role of power play quarterback has never been more important. On the power play, defensemen have the best ability to manipulate and break down the opposing defense because of their positioning on the ice. As they can survey the entire blue line, shift the defense one way, only to pass in the other direction, they also have the clearest path to shoot a puck for deflection. So when you have that elite defenseman, say, Kale McCarr, they have gravity. As in just the idea of the puck going to that player can rattle the opposition, causing them to cheat on a play, which opens up the ice for a bang bang play. And with that being said, many NHL teams have shifted to the four forwards, one defenseman model. Why you ask? It is most effective to have a single player orchestrating the offense. Therefore, even if you have the two best offensive defensemen in the game, one of them will become unnecessary, redundant. And this would prove to be the case in San Jose, as both Brent Burns and Eric Carlson would see steep regression in their game. San Jose's power play would go from consistently being in the top five to the third worst power play in the league. There were too many cooks in the kitchen. So when you have two of the same players, one of them needs to change their game. But then the question shifts. If you are a coach and you begin reducing Brent Burns' power play time in favorable 5-on-5 five -five matchups, is his defense worthy of $8 million per season? Probably not. You could find a much cheaper defenseman who can fill that role with millions of dollars to spare. This exact same scenario also played out in Vancouver, as the Vancouver Canucks would acquire Oliver ekman Larson. A man who made his money on the power play. But Vancouver Canucks already had Quinn Hughes. And there is no scenario where Quinn Hughes isn't their number one power play quarterback. So if you remove the most prominent part of OEL's game, the offense, what do you get? An average defenseman who got paid a boatload of money because of the offensive parts of his game. You forced him to change, he regressed because you already had the same player. But then it would happen. San Jose would ship out Brent Burns to the Hurricanes for a bag of pucks. And what do you know? Both players in a new environment where they could be the number one guy. Brent Burns would pop off with an 18 goal, 61 point season, good enough for 10th in Norris voting. Jacob Slavin, who is already their number one go to guy, would go from 110 minutes on the power play to 11 minutes this entire previous season. As a result, his scoring would drop off. However, in this case, it doesn't matter. Slavin and Burns, Slavin, Slavin, Slava Slavin, are both elite top pairing defensemen, but they are two completely different players. This acquisition would make the Hurricanes blue line more well-rounded. Eric Carlson, without Burns this year, would score 25 goals with a grand total of 101 points, which would earn him his third Norris trophy. As the Eric Carlson-Brent Burns story is 
the epitome of how getting the best player available, by no means, is the best player for your team, as this phenomenon is not new by any means. History has seen this story played out. Back in 2004, the Colorado Avalanche, anticipating the implementation of the salary cap, would put together what was arguably the greatest team ever assembled, as this team had five Hall of Famers, four players, who had scored 50 goals in a season, five players who had scored 100 points in a season, a number one shutdown defenseman. However, it was like a kid trying to jam a square block into the circle. Why won't it go in? This, this should work. And it didn't. And on July 1st, 2018, when Kyle Dubas would make his presence known to the entire sports world as he would sign Tavares to a monster seven year, $77 million deal. It was seen as a great thing. In fact, it was celebrated. And around this time, teams around the league were emphasizing center depth. The Kings and Penguins had just proven that this model sees consistent results. Having two number one centers is a great thing and is a lot different than two offensive defensemen. Both centers can play on the power play, having two number one centers can be a matchup nightmare. All of this sounds great, right? Well, now that we've clarified the pros and cons of having redundant players, the next discussion is how many number one players can you afford? Carey Price in 2021 became the first player in the salary cap era to make more than 10 million and win a single playoff round. Depth wins championships not a star player. If that was the case, McDavid would have several cups. So, when you consider that Dubis knowingly gave Tavares a $77 million contract, knowing that Nylander, Marner, and Austin Matthews needed to be signed shortly after, it makes me think that Kyle Dubis either thought that Matthews and Marner were going to take team-friendly deals, or that the salary cap was going to raise exponentially to the point where it wouldn't matter. And well, Neither happened. In fact, the exact opposite would happen. Why is the direction betting on the salary cap? And keep in mind, this has nothing to do with whether these players deserve the money or not. It has to do with Kyle Dubis running a billion dollar franchise, betting on an external factor, the salary cap that he has no control over. Because on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have the Vegas Golden Knights. And I made an entire video about how I think Vegas's cup win is going to change the way teams approach roster construction. Because instead of focusing on the best player available for trades or signings, instead of betting on external factors, Vegas made a bet that their pro scouts will find the guys who may not be the most desirable, but the players who are going to be the best fit within the existing roster. Vegas even made some massive trade blunders. However, they were able to sustain flexibility because they didn't overcommit money. Whereas Dubis and Toronto, yes they made admirable attempts to create depth, but because of their cap situation, these players were acquired for a single playoff run, which is a whole other dilemma. How many trade deadlines in a row can you continue to give up first round picks and prospects before you create a massive crater in your asset pool? And to give Kyle Dubis credit, he's a GM that makes things happen. We all goof on the Islanders, Lou Lamorello, for doing the exact opposite. Kyle Dubis is the anti-Lamorello, because after attempt after attempt, where they would see little to no success, finally getting past the first round hump this season, Kyle Dubas would pack his bags and part ways from Toronto, where he would join the Pittsburgh Penguins. However, history would repeat itself. Chris Letang has been running Pittsburgh's power play on the blue line for well over a decade. And even though his defensive game is not elite by any means, his offense was able to put him into the elite conversation. So why? Yes, he made a big splash acquiring the previous Norris winner. But if Carlson goes to the Penguins, maybe he does maintain his point per game status? But as a result, you are now taking away a massive part of your current number one defenseman's game, the offense. So is Chris Letang a good enough defensive defenseman to warrant his contract? No, probably not. Chris Letang put up over 50% of his points last season on the power play. His defensive stats say there's more to be desired. And this is nothing against Letang. I respect the hell out of the guy. It has to do with spending your limited cap on players who complement your team, not by acquiring the most expensive defenseman on the market, which will inevitably take away from existing roles. But here's the thing, the Vegas video I made 
I would emphasize the importance of team culture and how it can single-handedly elevate players to the next level. The Penguins and Boston Bruins have developed the best winning culture in this generation. This culture is so prominent that players like Crosby are willing to take massive pay cuts in order so that they can spend that money on depth. Because of this culture, I do see a much better transition for Eric Carlson. But does this make this a massive win? Hell no! Let's talk about the title of this video. Is Kyle Dubas a genius? Or a fraud? If we consider that Dubas' real tenure began in 2018, so after the drafting of Matthews and Mitch Marner, I decided to make a comprehensive list of trade wins, trade losses, as well as free agency wins and free agency losses. Keep in mind, I'm focusing on players who they were able to retain. And well, here are the results. Yep, it is astonishing. Because what's crazy, Toronto has developed great depth scores, reliable defensemen, but because of their cap flexibility, or I guess lack thereof, even if Dubis was able to develop a player, he wasn't able to retain them because all of their money is tied up rooting to the Tavares signing. And aside from acquiring these stable pieces, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're bad players, Dubas during his tenure did nothing positive to sustain success. In fact, Dubas would do the exact opposite of Vegas. As in, he had many notable players within the team's control. Mason Marchment, Sean Dursey, Jared McCann, are you kidding me? Who were overlooked, only for another team to scoop them up, where they have developed into stars. So with that being said, Kyle Dubas has zero, nada, major wins during his entire tenure. So to me at least, the man is a fraud. What has he proved? I think it's not fair to judge a GM within the first, you know, two to four years of his tenure. Now, you can of course single out specific trades and signings, but I have to emphasize that GMs have a vision. A vision that can take five plus years to see results. However, it has now been five years since he was hired as GM, and in that time, Kyle Dubas has a negative free agency in trade track record. And aside from Nylander, he would fail to make reasonable signings. In fact, Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews are the only players in NHL history to sign 10 plus million dollar deals for less than seven years. This man was treading water for five years, and the success he did see was from the drafting of players on a team he wasn't fully a part of. So for the Pittsburgh Penguins, let's be positive, and I hope you learned from his mistakes. Oh wait, Sid and Malkin deserve another run? So let's see what happens. And for Toronto fans, I will be positive. Toronto still has amazing building block players. Trading out Nylander for a top pairing to a defenseman might just be the key. Toronto finally breaking the curse, making it past the first round, will prove invaluable for Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. But the idea that a guy gets paid millions of dollars to tread water and gets praised for it is mind-blowing. But what do you think? Is Dubas a fraud or did he do his best and the team failed him? Comment down below. Quick shout out to the RTH card store. The guaranteed auto pack is still in stock, as well as the new Canucks collection. And as always, thanks for watching.